very good evening everybody and today we have got a very important podcast a very serious podcast we would embark on a journey through the enigmatic world of quantum computing as we dive into the depths of this fascinating realm our speaker today is none other than the very reputed professor arun kumar pati who stands as a luminary in the field of quantum information quantum computing and the foundations of quantum mechanics with a legacy spanning over 3 decades professor arun's pioneering contributions have shaped our understanding of quantum information he is celebrated as the trailblazer who introduced quantum computing to india carving a path for groundbreaking advancements in this revolutionary field his remarkable insights have not only helped shape theoretical frameworks but also found expression in two of his seminal books quantum information with continuous variables and quantum aspects of life offering valuable insights into the intersection of quantum mechanics and everyday existence well please join us today as we unravel the mysteries of quantum computing under the guidance of a very senior and a very learned person professor arun kumar a visionary whose work continues to pave the way for quantum innovation and understanding sir a very warm welcome to today's podcast from physics for students thank you very much sonak for your kind uh, introduction and kind words so i truly appreciate it i am very pleased to be here thank you sir thank you very much uh, we are actually pleased to get you in our uh, system sir if you may uh, tell a little bit about uh, how the quantum computing or how the quantum information system actually started yeah so uh, this field of quantum computing is uh, already i would say more than 40 years old so it all started by uh, the basic question you know due to richard feynman you know one of the greatest physicist of uh, last century so feynman started asking this question so what will happen if you want to you know simulate quantum system on a classical computer and he found that it would be really inefficient to do so then he tried to revert this question you know he said okay so if not classical computer what can happen if you design your computer based on quantum mechanics so this is the question he started in 1985 and that was okay. kind of uh, you know the first uh, uh, you know uh, the notion of quantum computer came into play but that was not the whole story because uh, uh, he did not really uh, you know formalize the whole concept it was david dois who tried to formalize this question more precisely and actually he laid the foundation of quantum computing later on yeah okay so uh, sir uh, my uh, question is that uh, what was actually uh, i mean to say because you have been many years into this field what was actually the limitations that we faced in classical computers and even supercomputers that led us to quantum computing yeah so i mean one of the motivation uh, is, uh, some of you might uh, you know might be knowing is uh, uh, the traditional way to look at the way the computer industry is growing is uh, completely governed by the so called moore's law that tells you that every uh, two years this uh, you know computer chips double their you know size so so that means if you go by uh, this trending uh, at some point of time you will reach uh, atomic scale you know and once you reach the atomic scale then you cannot apply uh, classical physics you know quantum mechanics will come into play and if you do that the natural question is what will happen if you apply quantum mechanics to your uh, computing uh, chip do you see some new effect do you see some uh, novel phenomena do you see some amazing things so that is the kind of curiosity you know initially people thought of but that was not the only motivation the other motivation is actually to uh, to see how efficiently you can solve your uh, difficult problems in a uh, in a classical computer and it turns out that there are many uh, situations where you cannot solve 
your task in your even in supercomputer so that is the uh, relation which led people to think okay so let us use quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical physical systems and try to build something which may be able to efficiently you know um, uh, implement all the uh, computing tasks that you are interested in and it turns out that there are certain class of tasks which can really be uh, implemented much more faster much more efficiently in a much uh, shorter time compared to what you could do even in a supercomputer for example you know as some of you might be knowing that uh, one of the famous discovery was due to peter sour the prime filtration you know that if you do on a classical computer it may, it may take billion of years you know but in a quantum computer you can solve in a few seconds so that is a remarkable discovery uh, due to peter sour and that really, really uh, gave a big boost to this field you know this field of quantum computing and that's uh, how all this uh, thing started and uh, over the last 30 years there have been really tremendous development uh, in this field yeah yeah sir sir uh, that means what sir you are saying that the classical computer actually based was uh, is still based on classical uh, i mean to say computation or classical mathematics but the moment yes, we yes. start to move into quantum computing that we need a new kind of a kind of a physics which is quantum computing yes. that means oh, yeah. in some way sir uh, the physics that we do in general quantum physics and uh, the computation that we do i mean to say if you can please tell our viewers that that quantum physics and the mathematical part of quantum physics i mean to say whatever linear algebra etc complex uh, hilbert spaces that we are doing they are actually intermixed to produce a powerful uh, computation tool which is a quantum mechanics right sir exactly exactly yeah 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 so the basic relation you know is the following that uh, whether it is laptop or desktop or even supercomputer you know in classical computing what you do is you you store your information in logical bits so called classical bits and we know that classical bit can remain only in two distinct state at given time that is given a classical bit single bit it can remain only in zero or one okay so we also know that uh, any physical system which has two distinct uh, configuration you can store to a distinct logical state like zero or one you know uh, but once you go to quantum mechanics we know that not only your physical system can remain in a uh, distinct state but also it can remain in a superposition of two or more distinct states okay so what it means it means the following that suppose you have a uh, you know single spin or single atom or single photon we know that a single photon has two distinct polarization like say horizontal or vertical or a single spin has spin up or spin down state or a, if you think of atom it has a ground Uh, state or first excited state and so on you know so if you identify these two distinct states then you can encode this single logical state zero or one but then we know that in quantum mechanics we have something called linear superposition principle which comes to uh, you know we need this principle to explain your very basic uh, quantum feature that is so called the quantum interference that you learn in your ms days you know ms level so this quantum interference is something you cannot explain without this quantum superposition so quantum superposition principle is at the heart of quantum mechanics which completely demarcates your uh, line of thinking from class- classical world you know so once you bring that notion to quantum world then we know that uh, your physical system not only can exist in two distinct state but also it can exist in a, a linear superposition of these two distinct state okay that means if i identify my atomic state as a ground state at an excited state then it is also possible for me to have a uh, atomic state which is a linear combination of this ground and excited state okay so what it means then it means that if i encode this single bit like 0 or 1 okay i say 0 is ground state and 1 is excited state that means if i have this encoding procedure then by this linear superposition principle i can also have a state which is some alpha times Zero plus beta times one, and that is something uh, you know uh, is only possible in quantum world. As I said, this happens only due to your linear superposition principle, which is not there in classical world, and that tells you that 
your encoding procedure had completely changed from the classical world. In the classical world, your single bit can remain only in zero or one. Whereas here, it can remain, of course, in zero or one, but also it can remain in zero and one at the same time. So that yes. extra feature that you see in quantum uh, systems allows you to do something, uh, you know, miraculous, something imaging, and that's what this uh, you know realization came due to David Doyce. And if you think of more number of qubit, like two, three, and n number of qubit, we know that in classical world, given n bit register, it can remain only in one of those n logical state at a given time. Whereas in a quantum computer, it can remain in all those logical state at any point of time. So that is a huge gain uh, once you enter this quantum world. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, the type of calculation that we perform in quantum computers or quantum computing, I heard maybe I, it would be a foolish question, but you are a professor, so you can tell. It is mostly upon a very uh, complex structures like protein structures or something which requires a huge amount of computation power, which even supercomputers are failing to do. So if you can tell our viewers, sir, that what exactly is the type of computation? I mean, to say how, why, what is the complexity and what is the type of comp uh, computation which quantum computer performs, which uh, in the practical industry, which classical computers cannot do? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a very difficult, um, you know, very open question still. I mean, we still don't know, uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, what kind of, uh problems actually we can do more efficiently or more in a more faster way in a quantum computer compared to classical computer this question still open and that is you know an area of research by itself but what we have realized over the last 30 years or so is uh, there are some handful of uh, algorithms which really show that yes indeed you can achieve uh, or you can do certain tasks much more efficiently in a quantum computer as i said one of the first discovery in this uh, direction is source algorithm. And then uh, subsequently we have this uh, so-called uh, Grover's algorithm, which tells you that, uh, you know, to search particular item in a uh, uncharted database, classical computer would take, you know, on an average n by two number of steps, you know, if there are n entries. But he okay. showed that if you do quantum computer and using this linear superposition principle, you can, uh, search that mark item in square root of n steps. So it is not a great advantage compared to uh, what you see in source uh, filtration, but at least for large database, you see a mark improvement, you know, compared to classical system. So, so these uh, kind of things have been really driving force to see or to apply this quantum computing ideas and see where you can see the benefit. And this uh, database search is uh, just a, I mean, just one example, but people try to modify this algorithm and try to apply in traveling salesman or maybe optimization and many other directions also. So, so suppose you have some huge database, but you try to particular searching particular item in say, you know, in genome sequence, for example, you know, there you can apply this kind of algorithm and try to speed up your process compared to what it would be in a classical computer. So that's the kind of thing people are trying to explore. Yeah. Right. So, sir, I mean to say, as we understand that there are uh, still a long way to go this is a new long world but that means, yeah. yeah that means that uh, dna structures protein structures chemical structures i think these are very complex which a mm -hmm. general computer will take a long time to process and yeah, i think yeah, quantum yeah. can do it is not that say for example normal computation or engineering computation i don't think quantum computing is going to make anything uh, benefit for them because that is uh, in general yeah, but yeah. something Right, right, right. I mean, the audience should uh, be clear that uh, it is not true that uh, quantum computer can do everything faster compared to classical computer. No, mm -hmm. it is not true. You know, so one should not be carried away by the uh, you know by the uh, notion that uh, for every problem you, you need quantum computer. Then said, no, you don't need that. Only for specific things, specific tasks, you need yeah. quantum computer. What kind of task can give the benefit? That is that is the biggest uh, you know um, goal uh, you know part of the bigger uh, future goal to figure out that you know that is the biggest right. challenge yeah. Uh, so we got uh, questions coming in. Uh, Mr. Akash Saxena sir is asking 
Hello, sir. How quantum computing and quantum field theory are related to each other? Quantum field theory, I mean, not directly related because that is uh, uh, something you need to describe your, uh, you know, particle creation, particle annihilation, and so on. Uh, uh, quantum computing is essentially using the non relativistic uh, quantum mechanical principles, quantum mechanical concepts. You don't need field theoretical tools. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, there have been some developments with people trying to apply uh, so-called uh, the theory of quantum entanglement in quantum field theory, or maybe you know, trying to apply this uh, uh, entanglement uh, theory in say black hole information loss and so on. So there is some connection, but not directly related, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Mr. Akasha, with my uh, range of study, because professor is uh, uh, itself is an institution. I think quantum field theory is something which is an extension of quantum mechanics, where we are mm. taking it into quantum field excitation, where we are, you know, classically, you know, theoretically calculating the Lagrangian densities, etc., yeah, so yeah, that yeah. it gets expanded into more. And quantum computing is very much practical application on the machines, etc. Right. But, so, yeah, but having having said that, I mean, uh, people are trying to see. Uh, uh, you know, what are the tools that already are available in quantum computing or quantum information, trying to see uh, whether they can apply these tools in quantum field theory and see something, you know, uh, uh, some new phenomena or new effect or something. So they're still exploring, but I would say uh, to start with, there is no you know, direct connection. Yeah. Right. So Rudra C has a, got a question. How many operations it take to find prime factor on quantum computer? Is it just one operation? No, 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 not one. It is, it is polynomial. Like, like in a classical computer, it takes exponential number of steps. I mean, uh, exponentially, it is a hard problem. But quantum computer can do in polynomial time, not in one time. Yes, no. Right, uh, sir. We got a question from Shayun Chakraborty. He is asking: Is quantum error? Correction worth to pursue for research. This was actually I was thinking to ask this question. Yeah, yes. so thank that is one of the one of the uh, major area of research currently. Yes, it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mona Lisa is asking why we need quantum mechanics in India. I think uh, the question is not even clear. I mean to say quantum it, mechanics. Not, uh, quantum mechanics is independent of India or. Or you yeah, it is it's you know, you know, whether you live, right, whether you live right. in India or live in uh, any part of the universe, you need quantum mechanics. Okay, yes, so. yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, my question to you is that uh, as far as my study goes, quantum computer itself generates a huge amount of heat, uh, and that is why the cooling uh, technology uh, is quite expensive and requires an absolute zero kind of a temperature to make it. Uh, in a store in a place. How far it is true and why uh, quantum computer generates so much amount of heat? If you can just throw some light, sir. No, no, quantum computer by itself does not generate a lot of heat. I mean, to be able to uh, maintain your physical system, you know, in a coherent superposition, you need to cool down your physical system to, you know, semi Kelvin or, you know, few Kelvin to that uh, that low temperature, you know. So, so that needs a cooling system. And by itself, I mean, quantum computing by itself does not uh, generate heat. I mean, again, uh, what I'm saying is not fully, fully, you know, um, uh, right. But uh, but if you, if you talk about, like, uh, certain kind of operations in quantum computer, like you do in a classical computer, so-called resetting a bit, which you're familiar, right? In a classical computer, if you want to reset a bit, you indeed, you, uh, you know, you dissipate uh, heat. Same thing also, okay. if you want to reset your quantum uh, computing bit into some initial value like zero, okay, you actually, you, you have to spend some energy so that will uh, dissipate uh, into heat, you know. So but okay. apart from that, uh, I mean, uh, if you do any other algorithm in a reversible manner, you only apply unitary operation and they're reversible by definition. So they don't, uh, you know, don't dissipate any any heat. So for that, okay. you don't need 
but to maintain your physical system in a small position or in a coherent uh, control manner you need that kind of dilute dilution fridge and so on yeah okay okay so uh, sir my um, what i'm trying to ask is that that physical heat generation so for example my laptop or any other desktop we have got a fan which mm -hmm. cools the mm -hmm. kind of system so if you can tell the physical system the physical heat that the computer generates why why does it generate so much amount of heat so well, that yeah that have to that uh, what you uh, what you have pointed out is very good uh, you know very good observation so that had to do with uh, something called uh, landauer's erasure principle you know it is a, it is a very great insight uh, due to rolf landauer in um, early or maybe middle of 80s uh, who were trying to uh, connect physics and uh, you know and computer science or information theory and so on so before rolf landauer you know physics and information science and computer science they were disparate subjects you know they were, people are thinking that oh uh computer science and information theory there is something something after it you know nothing to do with physics but the answer that we know now is not really true you know it is physics and computer science and information theory they are intimately connected and this realization is greatly influenced by rolf landauer who realized that any computation or any information processing unit you need a physical system because to store and process information you need a physical system and to process information you need physical laws okay so mm -hmm. so you can define your classical computer and quantum computer very simply by saying that if you use a classical system and a classical uh mechanics to describe your physical process that is essentially a classical computer if you use a quantum system and use quantum mechanical principles then that is a essential quantum computer and this what i'm saying is essentially a consequence of landauer's great insight who also proved that to erase a single bit as i mentioned it before you have to spend kt log amount of energy so that is that is what you pointed out is that is at least minimum so what what you just pointed out is essentially due to landauer's uh, uh, principle that whenever you operate your computer or laptop you do lot of editing lot of uh, resetting and so on that generates heat and that is why you need this fan and this cooling system yeah okay i got it thank you thank you sir so rudrasi has got the question is the length of number increases does it need more qubits to find prime factors yeah yeah yes to to do a prime factorization uh, you know um of some sizable amount uh, so you need a large number of qubits in the physical system yes okay and he is also asking that how long can qubit hold the information yeah that depends on this coherence time you know uh, because as i said your qubit typically when you do your algorithm typically they are in a superposition state and superposition states are very fragile you know any external interaction or external disturbance can cause uh, you know decoherence and you will lose your uh, superposition so so depending on the physical system and depending mm -hmm. on the coherence time you can store information or your qubit can hold that much um, you know can hold information for that much amount of time yes okay sir i remember i mean to say i started my career in computer long back when there was a system called 486 dx4 and i remember first doing my computer uh, computation in q basic gw basic then object oriented programming came in so we used to do this kind of a flow chart which we call it as algorithm now there is something which is called quantum algorithm uh, if you can throw some light what, what is called quantum algorithm and how does it differ from the classical algorithm why it is so complex yeah so uh, i mean uh, typical when you say about a quantum algorithm essentially what it means is uh, a set of instruction that you would like to uh, give to your uh, quantum computer to execute certain task okay so in standard uh, uh, circuit model of quantum computing what you have is uh, you initially you prepare all your qubit in state 0 0 0 suppose you have n qubit register you prepare all your state with uh, state 0 
and then depending on your task okay uh, you have to design suitable unitary transformations so your algorithms are nothing but a sequence of unitary transformation that you would like to apply on this n bit register n qubit register okay so right. and then at the end uh, your quantum register will contain the answer and then you will do a measurement at the end and get the answer whenever you want to get the answer you to do a measurement because that is something that will convert your quantum information to classical information and then you read you know read it up you know but in between everything is uh, purely quantum so you don't need any measurement so you go on applying sequence of unitary operation and that is essentially the quantum algorithm uh, okay. that decides what to apply yes okay i have few um, a little bit more question regarding quantum algorithm but in between uh, manifest wistful is asking can the superposition of particles be altered by external force at the time of experiment doing a static quantum calculation for a specific region uh yes it can be altered by external force uh, i mean if you are doing some something for example some you are running some particular algorithm and in between you want to apply some external magnetic field for example you know that will certainly alter the state of the spin of particles you know uh, so that will uh, that can lead to also decoherence and so on yeah the answer is yes okay uh, he is uh, telling in capacity of space i mean to say i think uh, that is sir what you answered so yes it can be done yeah okay okay so manifest wistful i think sir has answered your question so, uh, sir um, what i was willing to ask you is that in a type of a, a typical uh, you know conventional programming if i come to that c++ etc we have got different languages in which we program a classical computer so what what is the language in which we understand it is the quantum language but how i mean to say what is the language how do we actually do the programming uh, on the, on directly on the computer or any kind of a tool what is the language that we use i mean it is still in you know kind of developing stage so like ibm uh, they have been developing the so called the qiskit program and uh, software so that's kind of language people are using now and different uh, different uh, private companies are building their own you know uh, software for implementing quantum algorithms so it is still kind of evolving i would say i mean okay. nothing final yet okay. but yeah okay sir mona lisa has got a question what are the uses of quantum computer in agriculture and how does it help ai yeah so there are two different questions so uh i mean there is no clear cut uh, proof yet that uh, quantum computing can help agriculture but there is belief that um, uh, it can help and you know, once you have a full fledged quantum computer it can help design up maybe some chemical you know some useful um you know in in, in growing uh, or maybe in design of new fertilizer and so on so that can certainly help agriculture uh, industry so that is still kind of belief but uh, i would say that a lot of hope is still there and uh, coming to second part of your question uh, how does it help ai uh, so this is a different direction that people are trying to explore so they are trying to apply quantum computing and uh, ai and there is a lot of uh, research going on uh, in trying to bridge this uh, and develop a new field called quantum ai uh, so uh, i would say again that uh, it is still futuristic uh, and uh, uh, the way we see currently the ai you know uh, has changed our uh, landscape in uh, computing or you know present present the classical computing devices i would imagine that uh, once you have a uh, combination of quantum and ai that will again be uh, completely revolutionized the future of uh, quantum computing i would say so i think it's still positive i would say right so brishnu prasad tripathi is asking how we use quantum computing in astrophysics and cosmology yeah this is too far fetch but uh, uh, again i mean whenever you know you are always i mean scientist <laughs> are always hopeful of uh, something that they will do something amazing 
so recently i saw uh, some article where people have tried to use uh, quantum imaging and they're able to uh, uh, you know process uh, the images that they received from uh, long distance you know so so some astrophysical objects they're able to have a clear image using this quantum uh, imaging process so that so quantum imaging is another area of research where they try to enhance the uh, you know uh, image quality using say quantum entanglement or quantum uh, coherent source and so on so using that kind of technique they are able to have a better image resolution you know of some astro astronomical objects so i think uh, still emerging i would say it will have some application I'm still not clear what, uh, what more but yeah there is always some hope yes so two questions coming up epan is asking sir good evening my question is how will indian education system focus more on quantum theory i mean it's a quantum theory in the sense i think he is asking about quantum theory and further into quantum computing yeah so i mean uh i would say currently uh, if you look at uh, most of the universities or colleges you know uh it is not really wrong to say that uh, quantum theory is not really taught properly uh so i i, I would say that i would recommend that uh whoever teaches quantum mechanics they should try to uh use i may mean, try to include some of the recent discoveries recent results in quantum mechanics and also maybe they can also give some background to quantum computing which will motivate the young students young minds and later on they can if they want they can pursue research in this emerging field you know so i would say that uh in addition to whatever they are teaching there should be a blend of you know new topics or new discoveries or recent results some you know so if they can do that that will certainly benefit uh, the emerging generation right yeah so uh, epan you got your answer sir has answered sir sandipan hazra is asking uh, sir can you please suggest some beginner level book on this topic yeah there are plenty of books but uh, but if you want to really uh you know learn the subject more rigorously uh, and also at the beginning at the beginner level then i would recommend uh, one of the classic book in this field uh, that is quantum computing and quantum information by nielsen and chuang one of the i mean one of the uh, best book and everyone follows this so you can look at that book if you want okay so thank you so uh, sandipan you got your answer sir uh, uh, taking ahead with sandipan's uh, uh, question uh, if say, say, say whenever uh, say for example someone is willing is willing to start a career in quantum computing so if you can just tell uh, us in details uh, first of all the level of mathematics and physics obviously it is quantum mechanics physics but what is the first step that a beginner should take in order to make a career in quantum computing in terms of degree in terms of understanding and in terms of uh, the level of mathematics which should be absolutely on the fingertips so that a person can move ahead and grasp a career in quantum computation either in research or in direct industry if you can please tell us sir yeah i mean uh, as you say correctly and you need uh, a very good understanding of quantum mechanics and uh, you know basic principles of quantum theory that is a kind of prerequisite you should have that and along with that uh, uh you better to a good grasp on uh, some of the mathematical tools like uh, linear algebra or maybe uh, you know uh, differential equations and uh, maybe group theory and uh, maybe uh a little bit uh, you don't really need topology but yeah i mean uh, or maybe real analysis so this kind of things will help uh, you know um, because in quantum mechanics as you know most of the things most of the algebra you need have to do with uh, linear algebra you know so if you are good at that i think you can understand most of the basic things but you know there's no end to learning you know i mean 
at some point of time, if you need something, you can always go back and learn uh, some new things, new tools. Yeah. So, so after that, say for example, if somebody completes a BSc and then an MSc in physics, how would he or she proceed in terms of quantum computing? Where we will go? What is the area of study that we should go ahead? I mean to say, how to take things forward? No, at least I mean after BSc it may be a bit difficult, I would say, but after MSc certainly uh, you can start uh, planning your career if you are interested in this field. And uh, currently, there are many institutes in India where they have actually, uh, you know, regular courses going on in quantum computing, quantum information. Like uh, when I was at HRI, we have been teaching um, quantum computing almost for the last 10 years or so. And okay. there are many institutes uh, now, you know, like IAC or maybe IIT Madras or, you know, IIT Kharagpur, IIT, uh, IIT Delhi. Many institutes actually, they uh, have started courses in quantum computing. So. So it is uh, really, you know, I, I would say uh, the current scenario in India is uh, pretty good and uh, very, uh, you know, very welcome. Uh, I mean, they really need more people, uh, more young people to enter in this field. Uh, so if you, some of you are interested, you can really, I would recommend that you should go for that. Okay. Okay, so sir, uh, we got a very wonderful question from Mona Lisa. But before that, uh, just one question, sir. So you are teaching in that particular university, quantum computing. Uh, the category of students, I mean to say, whom do you teach? Is it uh, professionals who are doing quantum programming, or are they students of MSc with some specializations or postdoctorals? No, when uh, when I, I was at HRI, uh, we had. Uh, uh, what to say? Mostly um, uh, MSc physics students they come to do PhD, you no, know, after MSc, or they also come after BSc. They do MSc kind of integrated MSc, then they go for a PhD. And uh, uh, sometimes also people, uh, you know, after BTEC, uh, they also appear for this GST exam. They come for uh, you know they once they got admission in this uh, in this PhD program. They also opt for PhD in the quantum computing. So there are, uh, I mean, not only from physics, I, I have seen uh, people from BTEC also engineering also they do come and do PhD. So for example, I had right. two students who did their PhD after BTEC. Absolutely. Rudra is yeah. actually saying that IIT Chennai has a great course in yes, uh, yes. quantum computing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yes, yes. And plus their faculties have a lot of free video on YouTube to get one started in quantum computing. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sir, uh, yes, Mona Lisa yes. is asking a very interesting question. <laughs> How can I get a PhD under a legend like you? And what is your motivation <laughs> for quantum computing? <laughs> I think, sir, we all want to know how you become a legend, the first person to introduce quantum computing. Your name is in Wikipedia. I mean to say, this is a, a, for, a you know honor for me, everybody to uh, watch you and to host you as a guest lecturer on my channel. If you can please throw <laughs> some light, sir. <laughs> so I I, I, I I don't know that I can answer, answer the first question, but second question I can answer, uh, how I got motivation to do quantum computing. So that is very interesting. and. Uh, Maybe it, it will inspire some of you. Uh, you know, my my first, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the first, uh, what to say, my excitement about quantum mechanics, quantum computing will come a bit later, but I first, first got really excited about quantum mechanics when I was uh, in BSc. And uh, when I was uh, taught in my class, the so-called wave particle duality. You know, when my teacher told about this wave particle duality, this de Broglie hypothesis, I was really curious. I thought, how come the single entity behaves both like wave and particle? I thought maybe something wrong, and uh, these people don't know anything. So, so <laughs> you know, I have to solve this paradox. You know, <laughs> so so that was the kind of motivation. <laughs> so I thought maybe maybe whatever we know till now is completely wrong. We don't understand anything. So neither they are we have not their particle, there's something else. So I had to figure out what is that, you know? So that was the motivation I came, I thought, no, I will do research only in quantum mechanics. So from BSc, I, I realized that uh, I have to do, uh, you know, um, 
I have to pursue this research. And uh, and at that time, I was not even sure after my MSc, I was not sure that uh, whether I will get some PhD position or maybe you know I will get some research position. So I was even determined that uh, if I don't get any uh, PhD position or maybe I don't, don't get any research uh, position in some research institute, suppose I get some bank job or maybe some um, some job in post office or maybe some odd jobs, I was decided that I will do research only in quantum mechanics in my part time. So, okay. so that was the motivation I had. And after my MSc, I luckily I got you know selected in BRC in Bombay in 1989, 1988. And then uh, after one year training program, I joined there as a scientist. So from there onward, I started my on my own research. And at that time, there was absolutely no one working in this field. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. uh, so I have to go to library and figure out uh, what are the current research going on and I have to look at I journals. Think, sir, and, uh, uh, the yeah. Internet says yeah. that you are the first person, sorry to interfere, you're the first person in India to introduce and do research on quantum computing. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I'm coming to. So, so, so. So I had to, I had to, you know, there are nobody, absolutely nobody to guide me, you know, at that time. So I had to find my own research problem and go to library and look at journals and see what can, what can I do, you know, what the research topic I can choose, because nothing was clear at that time, you know. So mm -hmm. once I was sitting in library and found a paper by David Doyce on quantum computing, you know. So I thought, oh, this is something really something uh, new, and this is maybe a lot of things can be done. So that's how I started. Uh, uh, you know, thinking about this field, and then slowly, uh, after a few, maybe a two, three years, I started working in this field. So that's how my journey started in quantum computing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for taking us down the, your memory lane. And thank you, Mona Lisa, for asking this question. It was indeed a great question. Thank you for that. Sir Akash Saxena is telling, I need to, uh, to read a reference book on quantum entanglement on a fundamental basis. Please suggest me some uh, books regarding this subject. Mm. Yeah, so I, I just said you can read this Nelson Chuang or you can read uh, John Preskill's lecture notes, which are freely available, uh, you know, on okay. the internet. Yeah, so, I, yeah. yeah. Mm. absolutely, absolutely. So Tarun Bharadwaj is asking, as every element has wave properties, can combining the waves associated with particles allow us to construct those particles as if we synchronize these waves at the same time frequency at the same frequency so so quantum theory tells that uh, given any entity at any point of time they are both wave and particle now depending on the experimental scenario or experimental uh, device that you have they will reveal one particular property at a given time. So if I have a, if I put a detector, I will see a click, I will see a particle. If I put an interference setup, I will see interference. That means I, that means the particle should behave like a wave and so on. So, so still we don't know what these entities are. So, so let me, let me, let me tell you uh, the following that the, 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 the motivation, the question that with which I started my journey in this quantum, uh, you know, this quantum uh, theory, quantum computing, the answer is still open. Still, you don't know in reality what these entities are. Maybe they are something else. We don't know, you know. We have an incomplete description. So with the existing tools, we say they are particle and wave, but maybe they are something else. Who knows? So. Right. Yeah, that is quite an open area. So, and he is asking, Tarun is asking, if this is possible, then can we build a quantum 3D printer, which can print any material without using any raw material? I mean, I think he is asking about the uh, reduction of price and how we can use this technology. Uh, I mean, even if, even if you have a classical 3D printer, you have the raw material, no? Without that, how can you print that? Right. You know, Absolutely. Absolutely. No, but even, even, even the classical 3D printer, you need raw material. Without that, you cannot do. So I would, I, would, I don't think you can do without raw material. Right. Sir, my next question is that uh, I read about your theorems. To be very honest, but I didn't understand anything. 
Now, my question, sir, is that what actually has been your contribution in a not a very technical way? If you can let us know, because I am, we are all willing to know uh, the. Uh, I mean to say, your work regarding quantum computing, what actually it is, in a very lucid manner, if you can uh, let our viewers know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, so one of my early motivation uh, in this field was to understand uh, how different is uh, quantum information from classical information, you know. So because this field was emerging, so I thought maybe good to understand uh, the key features or key differences between classical and quantum information. So with that motivation, uh, I tried to ask you know, several questions and uh, some of the questions may be wrong. Some of the questions came out to be right. And so in that process, I tried, I we tried to prove this so-called uh, no relation theorem. Uh, mm -hmm. Before that, uh, there was already 1982, there was already something uh, very famous called quantum no crawling theorem uh, mm -hmm. that was proved by Uters and Jurek in 1982. That tells that you cannot make copy of a unknown quantum state or a single quantum state. What it means okay. is the following. So classical in classical world, okay, uh, whether it is classical laptop or desktop or your mobile, whatever information you have, you are always able to make a copy, okay. Hmm. Um, and it, this is exactly similar to your Xerox machine. In Xerox, Xerox machine, what do you have? You have a device, and you uh, you feed some input uh, page, and you have a blank page, and you press a button, and you get. The original along with a copy okay so this is exactly what you will do uh, to copy any classical information but can you do same thing for a quantum uh, information that is can you build a machine where you send a quantum state and send a fixed state that is of your choice and at the output you would get two identical copies and that was proved by Uter Europe that you cannot do this okay you cannot make copy of a better quantum state and this actually plays a very major role in uh, quantum uh, information because this provides security to quantum mm -hmm. communication like quantum cryptography and many more other things. Okay, And okay. this also is one of the basis for so-called uh, uh, the notion of quantum money. There is also uh, uh, the implication of quantum information in quantum finance sector because People are proposing quantum money, which can nobody can duplicate it, you know. So because right. you cannot make money, this will completely remove the piracy issue with quantum information. So okay. that was already known. But what we proved is that suppose somebody gives you two copies, okay? Can you delete it? That is, can you build a device which will take these two copy and 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 reset one to a fixed state? That is, remove all the information and then keep the original intact. This kind of thing, we prove that you are not allowed to do using the quantum mechanical uh, you know, principles. So that is called something no deletion principle. And this is a kind of reverse of no cloning, but not really, because this is not in, not doesn't follow from the no cloning theorem. And okay. so it has more to do with uh, security of everything regarding currency, regarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah of credit card that means quantum computing actually in one way we can say that it enhances the uh, uh, cryptocurrency and the security system yeah, yeah yeah i mean once you have a full quantum information system whatever you uh, encode whatever you store only you can manipulate nobody else can or nobody else in the universe can do anything with that you know it is fully secure and that security comes not by your design, but by nature's design. Nature already given that, ah. uh, you know. Uh, Absolutely. It's a byproduct kind of thing. Yeah. So that means if is an information, say somebody transferring money from this point A to point B, and yeah. because of quantum superposition, in between, if a hacker or somebody yeah. intervenes, then it will automatically change its nature and we won't be able to. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Sir, I read about uh, strong uncertainty relation, uh, which you are a pioneer. You founded that uh, principle. Can you please, sir, tell us what actually it is? Yeah, so uh, so all of you, I mean, those who have done, say, you know, MSc physics, they are maybe BSc physics, you know that uh, there is this Heisenberg uncertainty mm -hmm. 
uh, right. which would be, uh, which tells you that uh, delta x times delta p is greater than h bar by 2. Or if you try to be more general, given any two non-commuting of variable a and b, uh, then right. you can prove that delta a times delta b is bounded by this commutator of a and b, uh, and its average is modulus and this factor half, right? This is your uh, sometimes called Robertson uh, uncertainty relation. So these relations tells you that it is impossible for you to uh, precisely measure two non-commutative observables with vanishing fluctuation because there is a lower bound to that. Okay. And what we try to prove is that there is more general way of capturing this so-called uncertainty between two non-commuting observables. So, so if you look at this, the more general version of Robertson uh, relation that I told, uh, it might happen that if you choose your system wave function to be one of the eigenstate of observable A or B, you mm -hmm. will realize that this commutator of A and B in a state say psi, if psi is one of the eigenstate of A or B, then this will be zero. Okay. That means even okay. suppose suppose you say okay psi is eigenstate of A. Okay, the, the right hand side is zero, but left hand side what you have is delta A is zero, but delta B is non-zero. So that means this relation is not telling you anything. Okay, so zero is greater than zero or equal to zero. It don't telling you much, right? So it is become trivial. Okay, so what we tried to discover is we removed so called this triviality issue in this Robertson or Heisenberg constant relation. We tried to be try to prove a new relation which will give a non-trivial lower bound to this uh, you know quantum fluctuation even if you choose this wave function to be one of the eigenstate of the observable a or b so our relation actually uh what to say it uh, removes this uh, you know this triviality issue and makes it more non-trivial and uh, uh and okay. more you know more kind of uh, uh, useful where you cannot apply the previous uh, Hagenberg or Robertson right. Yeah. So, so, so that is, is this some, yeah. yeah. So the, is this something which is uh, similar to this remote state preparation? Because that is also one of your discoveries. No, no, that is that is different. That is different thing. But yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Fine, sir. Uh, we got. Uh, 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 he is telling. I recently heard about quantum complexity. Could you tell about it? Thanks, sir. Yeah. So quantum complexity is again a huge uh, topic of research, huge area of research. So, uh, like you have classical complexity theory, people are trying to define uh, various classes of quantum complexity theory. So some problems you can solve in polynomial time. Some you can solve in in maybe linear time and so essentially, quantum complexity to do with the following fact that uh, given a particular task, how that will scale with the input size. Okay, so the solution to your problem on a quantum computer, how it scales with your input size problem, that is, I mean, the answer to that question is to do with the complexity theory. I mean, uh, in short, what do you, that that I can say. Okay, okay. Uh, he is telling that Leonard Susskind, I think, he is working on this. Yeah, yeah many people are working on that. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir, for this answer. Sir, Rudra C. has got one question. Is Planck length the smallest measure of distance? How much time does light take to cover Planck length? Will that be the smallest measure of time? Yeah. So, the current understanding of our physical theories like uh, quantum mechanics and special theory, uh, and uh, general theory of relativity. So if you if you believe that uh, all the theories are uh, you know mm, uh, correct, uh, there is no deviation with the existing theory. Then Planck length is the smallest measurable length that we have, and the Planck time is essentially also expressed using the Planck constant and the speed of light and the gravitational constant, Newton constant, and so on. So essentially, uh, uh, if you if you use speed of light and uh, this Planck length, then you get the shortest time also Planck Planck time. 
Essentially, right. I mean, if you so Planck Planck length divided by Planck uh, time, essentially will be the speed of light C. Speed of light C, right? Thank you, yeah. sir. We are almost coming to the end, and I'm thankful, sir, has got a lot of time. Sir, uh, one question that keeps me thinking is that if we talk about the, uh, I mean to say the uh, the problems or scalability uh, in terms of hardware, I mean to say uh, the quantum system accommodating a large number of qubits. So uh, my question, sir, is that what are the major hurdles in uh, scaling quantum system to hold a large number of qubits and what breakthroughs are necessary to uh, what we get is a fault tolerance scalable quantum hardware. If you can throw some light on this, sir. Yeah, yeah, this is a very, very, very good uh, question you have uh, pointed out, uh, brought out. So uh, this is actually uh, you know, one of the biggest challenge uh, we are facing. Uh, I mean, we means uh, various uh, companies are facing. Uh, so to have a large scale or full, full flash quantum computer, you need to go uh, something like, uh, you know, few thousand, maybe 10,000 number of qubits, you know. And once you scale up the number of qubit, it is not very uh, easy to maintain the coherence at a single qubit level. Because once you have more and more number of qubit, each of the qubit, they will talk to each other and they will try to interact with each of them. And mm -hmm. slowly they will lose the coherence, okay, with, uh, as time goes on, you know. So, but at the same time, you need more number of qubits because that is what your goal is, right? You have to scale up your number of quantum systems, quantum, quantum number of quantum qubits. So, so in one hand, you want to maintain the coherence. In the other hand, you want to scale up the number of qubits. So this is kind of trade-off, you know, you have to kind of optimize this, uh, uh, this uh, numbers, these numbers, you know. And here, the biggest challenge is, as I said, the, the, the coherence time, okay? And once, once you, once you have a device or a scheme to fight the difference, you have okay. to bring error correction. You, if you build up the error correction, I mean, inbuilt uh, through your uh, computing quantum company device, then even if this error happens, your error correction will take care of that and you will have the answer at the end of the day, uh, which is uh, what you desire, you know. But if you don't have the error correction mechanism, uh, most of this, like present day quantum computing devices, they're mostly noisy, you know, they're noisy, they're called in noisy intermediate scale quantum computing devices. So they they are good for some simulation or maybe some particular specific tasks, but not really not, uh, you know, not yet uh, full fledged quantum computer. So this is the biggest challenge, how to fight decoherence, how to implement error correction, the two biggest challenges people are trying to face. And that's where you need this fault tolerant uh, uh, quantum computing to play a major role in future design of machines. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for giving this information. Sir, a few more questions before we end. Rudrasi is asking, can one have more than two qubits entangled? Can they all be teleported to different places? Yeah, yeah. The first question answer is yes. I mean, you know, there is no issue about that. You can you can entangle two, three, you can entangle thousand or million number of qubit in principle. Nobody will stop in doing that. But in practice, whether you can do that, that is the biggest goal. And people are trying to achieve more and more number of uh, you know qubits being entangled. So that is the again one of the major goal. And uh, uh, if you want to talk teleportation, of course. Uh, there is a restriction that uh, given a single, you cannot teleport a single qubit to many places because that will violate no cloning theorem. Because if you could teleport this qubit to say two places, you will get two copy at A and B, which is not allowed by no cloning theorem. But if you have many qubit, each of them you can teleport to different places. That is, that is still allowed. Okay. Okay. Sir, um, uh, his question is that uh, how does nature fight decoherence? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, again uh, very, I would say, very deep question. So, uh, if nature indeed knows how to fight decoherence, that would have a deep implication, you know, because uh, we still don't know. I mean, 
the question that you are trying to ask is based on the assumption that nature indeed knows how to find decorance. Okay, so we still don't know whether nature actually knows. <laughs> so assuming that nature knows uh, how to find decorance, maybe there is some inherent mechanism. Maybe maybe there is some uh, you know uh, shielding mechanism to protect each of the qubit, each of the quantum state from the rest of the environment and so on. So we still don't know. So the I mean the short answer to your question is we don't know. But assuming that nature does it, I am I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this will have deep deep implication in variety of other contexts also. Okay. Sir, Anant is just asking your views that what are your thoughts on Elon Musk? <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a bit general question. I don't know what uh, what you have in mind. So, yeah, absolutely, sir. My uh, last question too is that uh, I mean to say, uh, say for example, uh, if we talk about uh, the industries that is, uh, I mean to say, those who are going to get affected. So, what I'm trying to ask is that how prepared are industries, and for example, governments and regulatory body, uh, bodies for the I would say potential disruption and informations that widespread adoption of quantum computing might bring. I mean to say, are we are we mentally ready? How 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 we will take things up? Yeah, yeah. Again, this is a very very pertinent question and very very important question that you have uh, you know pointed out. So uh, uh, the government is taking uh, you know uh, very good. Uh, step in trying to uh, bring industry and academia and uh, startups to this uh, you know this quantum uh, emerging technology like quantum computing and quantum communication and as you might all of you might have seen that uh, national mission uh, is already initiated by you know government and any at any point of time it may be soon they will announce it and uh, there are several private bodies also, private companies that are trying to build, uh, trying to get quantum ready, and they are really, uh, you know, at a, at a, at a uh, uh, right speed, they're trying to develop like quantum software, they're trying to, some of them are trying to build a quantum communication device like uh, quantum random number generation and quantum uh, key distribution system and so on. There are many companies in India already, they are uh, you know, very good at that. And uh, coming to the the third aspect, that how the ecosystem should develop. So, with regard to that, already uh, there is a so-called quantum uh, uh, ecosystem and technology council of India (QETCA), which uh, was established by uh, Rina Dayal, and I am also one of the co-founders of that. So, that entity is trying to, uh, I would say, you know. The prime goal is trying to build the gap in industry and academia, you know. So, uh, because industry people, they don't know how to start the research and the academic people, they don't know how their research will be beneficial to industry uh, people, you know. So, so this QETCA is trying to bridge this gap and trying to bring partnership and build the collaboration between industry and academia and uh, trying to escalate this, uh, you know, this economic computing. Uh, program in India, so that is still a long way to go, but slowly it is happening. I would say. Absolutely, uh, I mean yeah. to say, sir. For, for example, in in terms of uh, uh, when computers came in, uh, there was a lot of mental change in terms of government, private sectors. That are we going to lose a job? Because we thought that general computer. I mean, just a desktop computer. Long back, we thought that everything yeah. is going to go away. Same thing is happening with artificial intelligence. People yes, think yes, that yes. if we get an AI, then we will lose out the job. But that is not. I mean, to say they are making life easy for us. So in quantum computing, do we have a fear of anything that the uh, private sector, public sectors, uh, go, people who are writing blogs, who are making videos, those who are uh, writers or anything, is there any threat that their jobs will be replaced by quantum uh, computation? Not really. No, I, would say, I don't think so. It will never replace uh, by quantum AI, in, if at all, in future, if that happens. So, I mean, we should be prepared that, uh, 
even if quantum ai get uh, developed uh, you know by merging ai with quantum computing devices it should be you know should be ready to complement each other you know should not be we should not get feared or you know that uh, that our job will get replaced by ai or quantum ai so i, I don't think that will ever happen so yeah absolutely so this question i, I think you have already answered uh, youtube uh, sorry books or for recommendation if you can mm -hmm. sir please repeat the name of the book which you because anant is asking yeah this is yeah this is very i mean there is a very classic textbook by michael nelson and isaac chuang and the title is quantum computing and quantum information and the publisher okay. is cambridge cambridge university press so very good book and very classic book you can go through okay thank you sir yeah. sir my last question to you i won't take your time this is uh, actually thought to ask you long back but anyway sir in terms of say for example social i mean to say everything is now uh, you know associated with society so uh, my question is that what kind of ethical considerations uh, i mean to say should be addressed regarding the use of quantum computing uh, particularly i mean to say in terms of biases that happens in algorithms data privacy and what would be its social impact in the various communities Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean again um, uh, this is one of the prime issue many countries are trying to focus actually so for example australia a uh, few months back they developed an ethical code ethical uh, you know uh, guidelines how this quantum uh, industry should uh, uh, shape the future of industry in the kind of web collaboration and so on and recently in india also so uh, this our qet uh, this entity trying to bring guidelines about this ethical principles so i think uh, slowly there will be some uh, concrete uh, outcome for this yes so sir also what i have found it then when we are working with chat gpt google bard or anything i uh, it also always shows it is experiment that means i mean to say the system is learning as we feed in more data it is learning but one thing which kept me very strange say for example i ask a question say for example uh, uh, what is manifold in differential geometry or any kind of a question say for example a kind of a little bit um, uh, mathematical question now what mm -hmm. we you will see sir that chat gpt or google bard gives the answer i i do not have anything right now i don't remember any kind of an answer mm -hmm. then when you again ask uh, these ai tools that are you sure especially with chat gpt what i have seen is that are you sure say for example uh, say i was asking a question that uh, are uh, is every reversible function continuous is there any function uh, which is uh, reversible but it is not continuous i mean to say for homeomorphism from here to here it goes for a smooth function and also it should be true uh, for the reversible function so my question was that is there any function which is reversible but yet not smooth now they actually it gave a kind of a answer i think directly a function or something then when i challenged ai do you think that this is the right question then the ai started saying i am so sorry apologize then gave her yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. this happens many times yeah 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 what is the reason i mean to say is this the system is not fed with the data or any kind of a problem yeah most likely i mean system still learning i think so so i mean you 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 gave a very many uh, very sophisticated example but even with very trivial example uh, you can uh, you can okay. get similar uh, confusing answers you know so okay. you might you might have seen also um, uh, uh, in linkedin somebody posted and also i i tried uh, uh, repeating same thing so i asked chat gpt what is 2 plus 7 he said it is 9 i said it is are you sure he said ah. chat gpt replied okay let, let me check again then i said my wife says it is 8 then he say then you got to reply yes your wife is correct i am sorry it is 8 this is not happens yeah <laughs> so. yeah sir last question from atharv uh, uh, you know one of my subscriber uh, sir i have a question what are the latest breakthrough or advancements in quantum computing yeah so the latest the record i don't know if you saw you might have seen or some of you might have seen that um, the atom computing they have developed uh, the largest number of qubit uh, based on uh, uh, atomic qubit uh, that number really stands out which is about uh, 1225 number of qubit 
that is quite record breaking and very recently only on 4th december ibm also launched this uh, new uh, you know platform that has something like some uh, about 1100 number of qubit so these are the record breaking things currently we have okay thank you sir for this wonderful session and thanking all the subscribers also who ask this question sir any last message that you would like to deliver to the young people and all of us who are watching anything from a person like you anything you would like to share please yeah so i mean yeah my my only message uh, is uh, if some of you are interested to pursue quantum computing i would say this is the right time and this is the most uh, you know uh, uh, most uh, i would say you know yeah uh, useful i mean the opportunities are really fantastic uh, because uh, you have a lot of funding lot of opening lot of um, job uh, not only in the academia also in industry side and uh, future is completely bright you know i mean when i started absolutely there nothing you know and now after 30 years i mean you see exponential growth in this field you know you not only funding i mean also uh, opportunities and uh, uh, people working in this field and so on so number has really grown really you know exponentially you know so i would say this is the right opportunity and if you are interested if you are keen to know the subject to explore more you should go for it and i think sir you created the platform i mean to say when you started 33 years back it it was just on a very infant stage and now after 33 years you being the founder of quantum computing in india how do you feel sir i mean to say what what is your um, you know uh, reflection on this how do you feel uh you no know, some sometimes i feel good sometime i mean i feel still you know i'm i'm learning you know because this field is advancing so much every day you see yes. You know, several, you know, 20, 30, 50 papers, you know, on in archive, and uh, even you know, even after working 30 years in this field, sometimes you you feel that if you see a paper, you not know, not sure that you will understand, you know, because the field has advanced so much. Unless you are working in a particular a particular direction, you may miss, uh, you know, what others are doing, you know. So this field has really grown very mm -hmm. fast, you know, and that is not a bad thing, I would say. But uh, yeah, I mean, still. Every day is a challenge. Every day you have to learn new things. So, so yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. I think, sir, uh, the those who are watching today's session, if they want to contact you for any kind of a help or if they want to pursue PhD under you, I think uh, uh, they can directly contact you via LinkedIn. And uh, sir is there, I think, to help. And I was uh, very fortunate today to host uh, because this is the end of the uh, this year. And I think, sir, getting you, it is a matter of real honor. And uh, I, I really don't have any words. We got a lot of insights. We got a lot of learning. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, uh, and uh, uh, for your time and for your uh, uh, hosting this me in this on your channel. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And wishing you a very, uh, I would say, a merry Christmas and a happy New Year to you yeah, and your you. family. Same to you. And may you stay happy, healthy, because you are the person like you, I mean to say, who really shows us the path. And for Physics for Students, for me, uh, hosting this show, it was incredible. I will say you, I was very tensed <laughs> to host you because I don't have much of an idea on quantum computing because I'm mostly into, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the I would say classical physics, quantum mechanics and quantum mm -hmm. field theory more into the mathematical part. So thank you very much, sir. I won't uh, take much of your time. Thank you uh, for coming and thank you for the, all the subscribers. We have few more podcasts which are coming up on machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. And uh, we, I have my webinar on general theory of relativity, free webinar, which you can participate on 31st of uh, December, starting 8 p.m. I already got registrations which are coming up. Uh, so with that note, a uh, big note of thanks to Arun. Thank sir. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Take thank care. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sir, Atharv is telling thanks a lot, sir, 
for sharing your profound about quantum computing. You are my biggest inspiration, and a lot of Indians are proud of your work. Actually, sir, thank when you, I thank you, thank you, I when I floated this in YouTube, there are a lot of people who told that he is one of the greatest scientists, pioneer in quantum computing in India, and uh, we would be happy to uh, watch him live on the show. So, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. Very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take Thank care you. and stay safe. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Goodbye, sir. Bye. Bye.